Hello everybody, this is Anthony for Investors Underground. Today, I have the pleasure to speak with one of the legendary members within the Investors Underground and trading community. He first learned how to trade in college and during his senior year, learned how to short overextended small caps to the downside. After graduation, he began trading full-time and has enjoyed massive success. He's no stranger to sharing his trading journey and his wisdom. He's given several interviews. This is his second on the Investors Underground channel. He was profiled in the book Momo Traders as the scanner, and he's given several speeches at Traders for a Cause. Every one of them has been exceptional. In addition, he's also an avid investor, buying U.S. farmland and learning how to trade options. We'll get to discuss all of these things and more. It is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Phil Godeker. Hello, Phil. Thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. Anthony, it's awesome to be here, man. I've uh, been looking forward to doing this for quite a while, so it's, uh, it's going to be a good day. I think we're going to get a lot of good stuff covered. Absolutely. And I just want to say it was great to meet you at Traders for a Cause uh, this past year. You had an excellent speech, as you always do, and you always are extremely helpful to the traders out there, whether they are beginning traders or veterans alike. Sure. No, it's a great experience. It was great to meet you as well, and it's great to meet all the traders out there. It's, it's really nice for at least once a year, everybody to get together, talk training, share their knowledge, share some ideas, have a great time. So uh, the feeling was mutual. It was a great time out there. Phil, I guess I wanted to start by just asking, you know, you've enjoyed massive success as a trader. And so what keeps you interested day after day, week after week, year after year to wake up and prepare to trade the market? Well, it's really um, a love for the game. You know, when I started trading at like, you know, 16, 17, you know, a few trades, but really kind of more 18 to 19, I was just hooked instantly. I mean, it's it's like a video game that never ends. You're hooked, you're addicted. You want to try to learn more. Always get to the next step. I mean, you might be here, you might be high, you might have beat your expectations of where you want to be in your career, but that doesn't mean you can't get better. I mean, nobody has a perfect career. Nobody is perfect. So you always want to try to reach, you know, I don't know if the word is perfection, but you you always want to try to improve, get better. And it's just a drive. I mean, I don't know that I will ever completely stop trading. You know, my trading has evolved and changed over the years, the amount of hours I put in, what time I work um, and, and, and so forth. But it's it's a love for the game that I don't think will ever change. And I talked about this in Vegas, that if I won the lottery tomorrow, I would still trade. It wouldn't, it wouldn't end for me because I could have all the money in the world, but this is what I love to do. <laughs> so when you love what you do, why would you ever want to give that up or, or stop or do something different? So I truly just love it. Yeah, absolutely. There's always something new to perfect in trading. And then on top of that, the market changes as well. Right. Without a doubt, the market is changing, and, and that's one of the things that keeps trading interesting is that what worked you know, last week or last month or last year may not work tomorrow or next month. I mean, every market is different. The market that we had in 2020 and 2021 is completely different than what we saw in 22 and what we're seeing at the beginning of 2023. So you have to learn to adapt and change or you will fail. Um, and I think... You know, one of the reasons that I've been lucky enough to have some success in the market is because I truly do love it. You know, I think that's what a lot of people that I know that do make big, consistent money, they all love it. You know, they don't they don't trade the market, you know, just for the money or um, just for the job. I mean, they're here day after day because they love what they do. And it's no different than any other job. I mean, Warren Buffett, uh, why does he trade at 93 years old? He obviously doesn't need money. He, he loves what he does. Elon Musk, any big entrepreneur, they're in their career field, not for the money anymore, but it's, it's what they love to do. It's what they want to do. It's what gets them out of bed each and every single day to come in and uh, try to get better, you know, try to improve themselves, their business, their life, whatever it is. So. Is there certain things that you've learned over the years about trading or about how you trade um, that 
you would be able to give yourself at the start of your trading journey that's, you know, maybe something you wish you knew about yourself or the markets? Well, you know, when I when I started my trading journey, you know, I was 100% on my own. I had no, there was no chat rooms that I knew of. There was no Twitter. Uh, there was no nothing. I had Yahoo message boards, you know, which was a, you know, just a free for all. I mean, there was no, uh, no real knowledge base out there. So I learned everything. I mean, 100% on my own through trial and error and a lot of errors, mostly errors, right? But, you know, so it's through all those errors and all those mistakes that you finally uh, caught on and you finally said, hey, this is what I need to do to become successful. So, you know, thinking back to my early days of trading, you know, would I have liked to be in a really good chat room, have a mentor? I think so. I think that would help. But at the same time, you know, that's a shortcut. and um, you know, I put in thousands of hours, thousands of hours and stared at thousands upon thousands of charts and failed so many times that I am kind of happy looking back. It wasn't happy at the time. At the time it was very, very tough. But looking back, I think I'm lucky that I had to learn everything on my own and I had the do not fail mentality. So if you have the do not fail mentality, um, you know, it took me a couple of years of, of, of trading to become consistent. And, you know, I think it, it's a tough, it's tough to answer. Would it have been nice to have a mentor back then, you know, to cut that timeline in half? It would be, but then again, it wouldn't maybe have pushed me to learn everything on my own as I did, because um, when you're forced to learn everything on your own and you're forced to fail on your own, if you're resilient, um, which I was lucky enough, be at that age, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, um, you know, eventually you're going to find success. And I did. It just took took a long time. So at the time, it was rough and brutal <laughs> as much as I did. But now, you know, after I got consistent, that first year of becoming profitable just took off from there and I've never looked back. So I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the way I got started. During those early days, without a chat room, without a mentor, how did you work through some of the hardships, the adversity, the days where you had a big loss or maybe a losing streak? You know, if right. you think back to those days, you know, right. how did you get through that? Was it just brute force and, and just dealing with it? <laughs> well, it was it was easy in a way because I was in college and the money I was trading with, I didn't need. You know, so if I lost it, it didn't matter. It wasn't my living expenses. I wasn't trying to trade for a living to pay for a car or pay for food or pay for any of that. It was just, it was extra money on the side. And I viewed that money as kind of tuition that, you know, I could afford to lose. So the financial aspect was fine. The mental aspect, uh, you know, was tough. Now, again, I was in college, I was playing sports. So that kind of took away, I had something, you know, on the side that if I had, you know, several losing trades in a row or losing weeks in a row, I'd, you know, I, I, I had a side gig that kept me busy, but, that's one of the hardest things as a trader, even whether you're getting started or you're still in the middle of your career, because we all go through losing times and losing periods or slow periods. So um, that's one of the hardest things to deal with is just to understand that that's part of the game. I mean, it's, it's if you want to trade and you want to trade for a long time, you're going to go through losing periods, uh, slow periods. And um, you have to learn to be resilient and just understand that that's that's the way it is. So do you want to give up? Go get another job or do you want to realize this is what it is, this is the way it is. I have to stick with it. I have to fight through it. I have to keep learning, adapting, changing, tweaking what you're doing to try to get yourself an edge uh, to where you can start making some money. And I'm glad you brought up sports because I've sure. wanted to ask you this for a while. You're no stranger to competitive endeavors, having competed sure. at the collegiate and professional sure. level, if I understand correctly. Sure. And and so I have wanted to ask, do you feel like those years of practice and preparation, getting ready to perform, mm -hmm. were able to help you translate your skill into learning how to trade stocks? I think so, maybe a little bit. I mean, I was brought up around sports. I was brought up, uh, you know, with the soccer ball, basketball, volleyball is what I eventually took up in my hand. I was brought up to learn to work out with weights, run, stay in shape. And I think, 
you know, when I, when I finally dropped all my other sports and I took up volleyball and I played in high school, played in club and I played in college and I played some sand, a little bit of AVP before I hurt my back. I think, you know, my mentality in sports was similar to trading. If you're going to get involved, give it a hundred percent, minimum hundred percent, if not 110%, 120%, whatever you want to say, don't get involved to say, oh, I'll just play, see how it is. You know, if I'm going to get involved, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability as best and make myself the best player, the best athlete, the best teammate I can. Um, and I and I have that mentality with trading as well. If I'm going to get involved, I want to push myself. I'm not just going to do something, you know, you know, half halfway. I want to I want to be, uh, you know, push myself to the max, to my limits. And because that's what you're I think that's what you're born and developed to do. Right? I mean, use your God given abilities to. Um, to make yourself the best that you can be. So I do think that it definitely uh, 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 translated to trading a little bit as well, sure. Are there particular lessons that you think were, that translated well from sports? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's coming down to failing, you know, in sports, you know, um, do you wanna come in second, you know, or do you wanna come in third or do you wanna come in first? And do you wanna be the best team out there? Do you wanna be the best player out there? So it's learning to fail and realizing how you feel when you fail. Failing sucks. Failing, failing doesn't feel good. You know, failing, it's fun to play in front of a crowd, in front of a hometown crowd of, you know, I don't know, a few hundred people, 500 people, 1,000 people that are all cheering for you. How do you feel after that game if you win? And how do you feel after that game if you lose? Well, you're going to feel a heck of a lot better when you win. And so that drive and motivation is there, you know, it's in the back of my head um, back then at sports and then in training where, you know, what do you want to choose? What do you want to choose to do? Do you want to choose to be great? You know, or do you want to choose to be average and do you want to choose to be to possibly fail? So I was kind of, you know, I'm just lucky that I kind of have that mentality in my brain um, that, you know, I, I want to choose success and I want to choose to find success, you know, whatever way I can, whatever it takes to do. Um, so that's just kind of way my brain works. Now on the flip side, my brain sometimes never shuts off because it's always going, how can I get to the next level? How can I get better? How can I, uh, conquer this or figure this out or, or get to the next step? Um, but overall, you know, I think if you put it in your head that, Hey, I want to succeed, want to be the best I can be. Um, it's just drive and motivation that'll, that'll, that'll get you there. Would you say that the combination of being really passionate about the markets and that coupled with this intense desire to constantly be thinking about the markets and finding ways to get better are an integral, you know, sort of combination uh, for success in the markets? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, I've had several people that, you know, maybe hear an interview here or there, see me on Twitter here or there locally in St. Louis or, or, or even across the country, whatever, that say, hey, I'd love to you can tell me what you do. Can you, you know, we'll go to lunch or I'll buy you a beer. You can tell me what you do. I'd like to trade. And I'm like, well, that's fine. I will. I have no problem sharing it. But, um, you know, it's not something you can do, I don't think, part time really and succeed. You know, the way I think what has helped me succeed in the market is that, you know, I'm thinking about this stuff you know, all the time. I'm thinking about it as soon as I wake up, thinking about it when I go to bed. My brain, even sometimes when I'm coaching my son's sports during a water break, I'm like, ah, you know, let me, what, what can I trade today? Or how did this trade work out? Um, the market's on my brain all the time because I love it. I truly love it. So, you know, when you're, you know, when you really love something that you do and you're thinking about it constantly and constantly trying to think of ways to evolve or ways to improve yourself, ways to get to the next step, ways to cut your losses, minimize your losses. I think without a doubt in the world, it's going to help you out versus someone who says, um, you know, I, I work from home part time. I'll have an hour or two to give to the markets every day. And that's fine. You can make a little money, but you won't achieve huge success because um, I, I don't think, you know, it takes a lot more than that to, uh, to give. Absolutely. And I wanted to ask a couple of questions about your trading and how it's evolved over the years. I would imagine that the way that you trade today is a little bit different than how it was when you first started trading. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution of your trading? Yeah, no, it's a lot different. You know, when I started trading, 
Uh, when I started, let me let me talk about when I started finding success. So when I was 22, because those are the years before that, it doesn't really matter. I was trading a lot of different stuff, a lot of different ways. When I found success, it was shorting, you know, small caps or mid caps. And back then, I was trading at Scott Trade, who um, a lot of people don't know was actually a great broker for for locates back in the day uh, when Scott Trade was was around. Um, they had great locates, and borrow cost and short interest was not even a thing. I mean, that, I don't even think it was invented at that time. I mean, or if it was, Scott Trade never charged anything. So for years, my method was to find um, a, a multi-day runner, not something that just gapped up, you know, a day or two, but, you know, three days, five days, 10 days. Maybe it, it was running for a month, month and a half, something that was completely overbought, small cap or mid cap. Usually they're the same. They're, they're overbought. They're pumped up for some reason, a PR, whatever it is. And I would short those and I would hold them. Um, one week, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes a month, just write them all the way back down as far as I could, uh, cover them. And again, there was no borrow fees, no short interest, no, I mean, none of that, none of that stuff existed. And again, my memory, now this is going back, um, you know, 16 or 18 years, but I don't, at least at the time, I don't remember algorithms, um, you know, getting involved with this stuff. They, they could have been, I don't know, but I also don't think you had, you know, the 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 chat room, Twitter, sometimes manipulation out there. You know, we've seen um, even some chat room people now, not chat room, uh, Twitter personalities being prosecuted for stock manipulation and stuff like that. So back then, the stuff was not around. So the trades, at least from what I can remember, were much cleaner, you know, much easier. You're just seeing something that kind of traded naturally or, you know, and it could have been a, a pump and dump something behind the scenes, but, um, you know, you would have no problem holding stuff two weeks short, three weeks short, maybe a month short. And, you know, several years after that, I started to get into like one day runners, you know, something that just gaps up overnight, up 50%, 100%, reading the PR, seeing what it is, trying to decipher if I think it's, you know, overbought, going to go back down. So I added that to my trading arsenal. Um, but I would say in the last few years, um, the game has really completely changed with, you know, brokers offering free commissions, right? You know, most brokers offer free commissions. Some of the, you know, the paid brokers are, they're very, very cheap, you know, it's almost free, but how are they going to make their money? Well, <laughs> they got to make it somehow. So they're making it with, you know, they brokers understand shorting is now a big business. It's a huge business for them. It's a huge market for them. And locate providers have a big market. So when you short a stock, you got to pay for that locate, whether you use it or not, and you hold it overnight. Now you're paying that, uh, that clearing firm short interest for a day. Maybe if you, depending on what day of the week, uh, you could pay three days or four days if you shorted on this day and covered on this day. It's it's absolutely ridiculous. So, um, you know, as a short seller, you know, my intraday shorting will be the same because I'm still going to short something intraday. But now thinking about holding it overnight is a real, real thought. You know, I almost have to research what is my clearing firm charging? You know, what is the percentage what is the negative rate percentage they're charging and the, the crazy thing is that can differ huge day to day where monday it might be a hundred percent well guess what wednesday if you hold it to wednesday you're going to pay 600 percent or 800 percent i've seen bar rates you know years ago when i was at e-trade i think they had some you know well over a thousand percent um so i you know i mean you're, you're forced to adapt and say, hey, I can't hold this short for three weeks anymore. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't make financial sense. I mean, the broker is taking all the money, you know, so you have to do a lot more intraday shorting, um, you know, shorting the market, shorting at the open or shorting early, covering at the end of the day, maybe reshorting that next day. Um, so swing trading for me is my swing trades have dropped dramatically. And then you have to, you know, if you say, hey, I want to make the same amount of money, you're using a lot more size intraday uh, to kind of account for the fact that you're not holding short overnight. Um, and then, you know, it's, you know, again, it's the, you, you got to adapt to the way the market is. So when, when somebody's charging, you know, enormous fees, you got to say, hey, I can't, I can't do the same thing that I did two years ago or five years ago or 10 years ago. And that's kind of what helped me get into options a little bit as well, because there's no borrow fees or locates, you know, you don't have to mess with any of that stuff. So 
Uh, but I think the you know we see at times in the market borrow fees get crazy, you know, ridiculously crazy. Where I even have some friends will say, you know, what, I'm not even going to locate it. I don't even care. I'm not I'm even going to pay that price. And then clearing firms, obviously, it's a supply and demand business. You'll see a few weeks later they start to come down. But uh, but as a short seller. That's not fun to deal with now. It's an extra thought of, you know, what do you pay in fees? I've had years where, you know, I've paid well over a million dollars in fees, you know, short interest and locate. Um, and that's with watching my fees. That's with trying to, you know, not hold them as many days, not borrow as much, not borrow maybe until I need them. So, um, you really got to be careful as a short seller with those fees and stuff. So that's kind of how I've adapted. Yeah, that absolutely speaks to the importance of having to adapt when the market changes. And maybe it's not even just the market. It could be the broker who changes and sort of sure. the industry itself that goes through these changes. And as traders, it's up to us to figure out what works for us at the end of the day. And so I think it really highlights the importance of knowing exactly what's going to work for you and being able to adapt and, and switch footing. You have to, oh, without a doubt. I mean, you have to be nimble because, I mean, you cannot be stubborn and you've got to be willing and not even willing, but wanting to adapt as well. I mean, we've even seen some different brokers go from charging, you know, 100% maintenance requirement of stock. The next day, it's like a four, 500% maintenance requirement of stock where you used to be able to short 50,000 shares, but now with that exact same buying power, you can only have 10,000 shares. So um, amongst one broker is this, one broker charges that, one locate provider charges this, one locate provider charges that. So you have to be willing to, you know, to change and adapt and update yourself if you want to succeed. And I've heard, you know, it's sad because I've talked to a lot of traders. Um, a couple of them have been in Vegas and a couple of them have just reached out to me on Twitter or in various, you know, chat room here and there that have said, you know, I'm done trading. And uh, my year ended and I made, you know, $100,000, but I paid $175,000 in fees and I just can't do that anymore. And which is true. I mean, I, I get that point. But it's like, why did you let yourself get there? I mean, you know, why did you why did you wait till year end to realize you're paying all these fees or you're not being able to make it work? I mean, um, you know, you 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 need to realize this stuff on a day to day or week to week or at the very least a month to month basis of what's going in, what what am I taking in my account, what's going out of my account, how is the market changing, uh, how are different brokers changing, how are they adapting? So you've got to be able to do that for yourself or you're going to be left in the dark <laughs> and it's not, you know, it's not pretty. Absolutely. And, and that sort of leads to one of the questions that I wanted to ask about, which is about the importance of discipline and sort of being our own boss in trading. Right. The barrier to entry is really, really low. Right. Um, but it takes a lot more than just simply the capital or the desire so, right. And you've spoken about this in the past about being disciplined and mm -hmm. going back and taking a look at what your biggest losses on the year are. So how right. important is it for traders to be disciplined enough to understand what's working for them and adapt maybe their style or switch brokers if that's what it, it needs mm -hmm. to be? Yeah. Well, I think discipline is one of the most important attributes to being a trader. I mean, one of the things that I loved, what drew me to trading back in college was I could be my own boss. You know, I thought, hey, I'd like to figure things out on my own. I don't have to rely on coworkers. I don't have to rely on a boss yelling at me. I don't have to rely on this or that, whatever it else, whatever it is. I can be my own boss, figure things out on my on my own. Um, but there's also a flip side to that is that you are 100% accountable for yourself. You don't have a mentor. You don't have a boss. You don't have somebody else maybe in the industry that's helping you or leading you or guiding you along the way. So you have to figure everything out on your own. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons that some traders see really, really big success. Some might see mediocre, mediocre success. And I think that's the reason why a lot of traders fail. You mentioned the low barriers to entry. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's also, there's really no barrier to entry. You fill out an application, send in a few thousand dollars and anybody can trade, you know, tomorrow. That's what we saw back in 2020 when COVID hit. These brokers were opening up five, six, seven hundred thousand accounts per month, and that's what made trading really easy for a lot of, you know, more veteran traders because there was so much easy money in the market. 
um, because everybody thinks, like, you know, like, hey, I can I can open up an account and I can trade tomorrow. What what's to it? Um, but there's a, there's a lot to it. So I mean, discipline discipline is, you know, without a doubt, one of the main attributes and characters that is going to help you, you know, through a with a really long trading career. Discipline, um, no matter whether it's taking losses, letting profits ride, knowing when to enter, when to exit, um, because you know, in trading, you know, I think once you have market knowledge, which again, in my career, took me a couple of years to, to really have a good understanding of it. You know, you're always going to keep learning. But once you have that market knowledge, a lot of it's mental. I mean, I think I've read stats that maybe 70, 80 percent is just is mental. Um, it's really not knowledge is that you you have the knowledge. But what what do you do with it? How do you act with it? Um, and you know, I see a lot of traders as well that that have, you know, a good market understanding, a great market background, um, but they refuse to pull the trigger. And, you know, on, on that one setup a year, two setups a year, that that is a mega trade, you know, that that, that setup could take them to the next level, could take their income up, you know, 20 to 30 percent just off that one trade. But they're, they're scared to do it um, uh, or, or flip side on discipline you know, refusing to stop out, refusing to be wrong. I mean, you know, there's a lot of people that say, hey, I know this stock is junk. I know it's garbage. I know it's going to crash. I'm not cutting that loss. It's a lack of discipline. And we've seen so many traders come and go because they lack that discipline. And, um, you know, you're destined for, for failure, I think. So, you know, that's a big trait that you either have to have or you have to learn, I think, if you want to have a good, productive, long career in the market. Are there maybe one or two rules or recommendations that you would make in order to help traders stay disciplined and be able to preserve and keep their capital? Yeah, I mean, you know, the number one rule that I've always preached by far, hands down, is your losses, minimize your losses. You have to minimize your losses. And I, I, I gave this in a Vegas speech a few years ago. You know, I think the statistic is you can read this in a lot of different books, like 90 to 95 percent of traders fail. Um, that's a really high failure rate. I think one of the reasons that rate is so high is because, like you said, there's there's a low or no barrier to entry. So everybody wants to give it a try at some point in time. Um, but for those that give it more than a try and say, hey, I want to give this a year or two years or three years, and then they maybe fail. It's not a lack of winning trades that cause them to fail. You know, we all will have, no matter what your trading style is, going long, going short, swing trading, day trading, trading options or equities or futures, you know, every trader out there will have a trade where they say, oh man, the odds are with me. I mean, 80, 90% of the time on this trade, I'm going to win. And we all have those. They may come up once Maybe, maybe once a week, once a month, maybe once or twice a year. The reason traders fail is their losses, you know, and being stubborn and, um, and not adapting from their losses. You know, um, it took me, you know, back when I was learning, you know, back in college, I didn't know shorting existed. I had no clue you could bet on stocks to go down. Um, and back then, shorting, I don't think really was popular, certainly not amongst you know, smaller caps or mid caps, it might have been popular, you know, with hedge funds, you know, with larger caps, but, you know, so I was horrible, and I still am today at buying stocks. I am not, I don't have the patience, I don't have the discipline to buy a stock, whether it's a scalp, whether it's a hold, whether I say I want to hold this a week or two weeks or a month. So when I figured out that shorting was possible, and I could bet stocks go down, you know, I was like, well, finally, this works for me. And I virtually cut out going long completely. I mean, I stopped doing it back then. Um, and I mean, even to this day, I rarely will go long any stocks because I'm just, I'm bad at it, you know? So it's having that discipline to know, okay, this doesn't work for me. I can follow this guy on Twitter and he makes a million dollars a year buying XYZ, but that's great for him. That doesn't work for me. I know a few other traders that say, all I do every day is I just scalp Apple, Amazon and Tesla, those three names, and I try to make a couple grand and I'm done an hour after the open. Uh, and I've tried it and I suck at it. <laughs> I, I, I fail. So you have to know your strengths, you have to know your weaknesses. Um, 
But again, going back to having the discipline to cut your losses, it's cutting your losses through trades that don't work and cutting those trades out. But even trades that do work, it's okay. I think this stock is a short. Um, and I'm going to, this is my entry, but you have to know in your head, okay, if I'm wrong, where do I stop? You know, five or years ago or six years ago, you know, I lost a, a million dollars on dries. I shorted it at 15 or, you know, I shorted under 20. I know that. My average was under 20 and it ran up the next day to 30 or 40. I thought, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm not covering now. You know, I got, I have, you know, I have to reborrow and re, re, relocate the shares. First of all, I don't want to do that. Well, like a day or two later, it was at, uh, and I think 115 free market before it got halted. And that stubbornness, that lack of discipline caused me to take, what, what, you know, at that time, my biggest loss ever, a million dollars. Um, so right then and there, I put another hard rule in place that you've got to cut your losses, whether it's a, a monetary figure, whether you say, hey, if I lose five grand, I'm out. Whether it's a, um, you know, a, a, move, a percentage move in the stock, like, hey, if it moves five or 10% against me or 15% against me, whatever it is. You have to, have to, have to have a rule about cutting your losses and not being stubborn because that is, I think, that's the number one rule, number one reason that traders fail is they have one loss or multiple losses that could have been avoided with some rules in place. Um, and it's sad because, but that, that's what trading can do to you. You can make that quick money overnight, but guess what? It can take away your career overnight. So if you don't have those rules and discipline, I don't see how you can make it long term and be successful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I know that's not a fun one to relive. And Dries was <laughs> one of those 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 Great. rare stocks that we saw just fly. And and we spoke about this a little bit earlier about how in recent memory um, HKD comes to mind right. as being a very similar stock. We don't know where it's going to go. How far right. can it go beyond where it right. currently is? And it just right. keeps going. Well, and HKD is another example of, you know, you asked me about how do I, how have I adapted as a trader? That's another thing as a short seller, it's scary out there. I mean, you know, again, we thought dries was it. Oh, this stock went from 15 to maybe 115, whatever it was pre-market for halted. That'll never happen again. I mean, now HKD went from, I don't remember, it's low 30, 40 bucks to like 2,500. I mean, you know, so that puts fear in the mind of a short seller. And the thing is, the problem with those stocks is something like HKD, you know, you can't get out of it. You know, that, that stock a lot of times would halt, gap up. And I forgot, there was another one of HKD and it was right at Traders for Cause in October. And I mentioned that ticker, I forgot what it was, something with an A maybe, but some of these stocks, you know, I think they're Chinese scams, but they would halt, reopen 30% higher and immediately rehaul, open up 30% higher, 50% higher, immediately rehaul. You can't even get out of them. So, you know, um, as a short seller, again, those are in the back of your mind that uh, something that can wipe you out and you need to realize your position sizing on, on, on stuff like that. I, I heard of a few traders that had big sizing and, you know, ended their career on some of those moves. And that's, it's sad. It's really, really unfortunate because that, that right there is another great example of a lack of discipline. You know, you see some of these stocks shine a scam. I don't care what it is. A, a lot of all these low float or mid float, low cap stocks, they're all scammy, you know, whether they're true scams or they're just crappy companies, they're all garbage. And we all know they're garbage, but that doesn't mean that you should, you know, short two or three or four times the size that you normally would, you've got to stay disciplined and realize the risk versus the reward. You know, yeah, the reward is here and I want to make money, but if the risk is possibly getting stuck in a never ending halt or possibly ending a career, my God, you know, I avoided, you know, those HKD, all those things around, I never even traded them, never even barred them, never even looked at them. I had a couple of traders message me, oh, what did you pay for HKD? What did you... I don't even know what it costs. I don't even want to be involved because the risk to reward is so out of whack. You know, they, it doesn't even interest me. But a lot of traders, they see the the fascination and the, I guess you could say, the easier, fast money possibility there, and they want to they want to trade them. But uh, not for me anymore. <laughs> not for me. And Phil, is there anything that you do away from your desk? 
that you think helps you as a trader when you get back to your desk? It is hard as a trader to sit and stare at, you know, I've got six monitors here and all these quotes and all these lines and all these chat rooms and all these news feeds and all these option chains and all these level two all day long. It zaps you, it zaps your brain, right? So whenever I can, um, I, I work out every single day doing something, running, jogging, lifting weights, you know, it doesn't really matter doing that, but I love to get away from the computer, get away from the office, get away from my cell phone, whenever I possibly can, because it resets your brain, it resets your mind, you know, it refreshes you. Earlier in my career, I would kind of hate three-day weekends, you know, these, these holiday weekends, Memorial Day, Labor Day, Fourth of July, Christmas, you know, whatever it was, because like, oh, I want to trade, I want to be there now. I love them. I look forward to them. It's a day off, it's a day to refresh yourself and your brain and your mind so you can come back fresh. And, um, you know, something else I've learned through trading is that, I will trade best, and I think it goes for everybody, when they're thinking clearly, when they're refreshed, when, they're, when they want to be there. And there are days, um, it was similar to 2020. You know, in 2020, it was a record year for me. It was a record year for a lot of traders, and there was not a whole lot of time to take off. I mean, the setups were there from like May to, you know, that December. Their setups were there almost every single day, and you had to work every single day because the opportunities were there. So I'm not going to give up those opportunities, but you would definitely tell that you were kind of dragging, you know, you were, you were sluggish. You were dragging like, man, I don't want to be here seven, eight hours again. I don't want to do this again because it, you know, it sucks energy, you know, out of you to stare and to think at all the, all the information that the market gives you. So for me, it's a huge refresher to get away from the screens, get away from the office, do something different. I mean, exercise is great. You know, for me, I think it's great for everybody. Um, whatever you can do to get yourself that when you come back every morning, you're refreshed, you're ready to go. You're excited. You want to do this because everybody will trade better when they're in the right state of mind and the right mood. So whatever you can do to reset yourself daily, or you know, monthly with a little trip or a yearly, semi-yearly vacation, getting out. That's something like Traders for a Cause. I mean, it's a two to three day trip. It's wonderful, it resets you. You have fun, you meet other traders, you talk to other people, come back and you're pumped up, ready to go. Thank you, and that's a great perspective, shining light on the importance of being fresh mentally, being relaxed, being prepared to trade and wanting to be there to trade where, whenever that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. 2020 was just an outlier sort of year, but right. I think, yeah, that definitely speaks to the importance and the maturity that comes from trading year after year after year with understanding that we don't have to be at our desk pressing buttons all day or just staring at the screen. Uh, if we don't right. have to, we can maybe get more out of our time by stepping away. Without a doubt. I mean, and again, you know, now that I've traded, um, you know, eight, 17, 18 years, whatever the number is, is that I know when and where I'm going to make money. I know the setups that are going to make me money. I know the setups that I have a high probability of making money. Um, so those are virtually every single morning at the open, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I'm at, I can be out of town on a trip. I'm going to trade the open every single day, no matter what. And, but after that, you know, I know that, you know, if there's no setups or A plus setups, a lot of times an hour to an hour and a half later, you know, I'm gone, I'm leaving, I'm doing something different, going, doing yard work, <laughs> going, you know, swimming, bike riding, playing with the kids, coaching sports, you know, I do it all. So, you know, without a doubt, I think, you know, there's a time for that, you know, early in my career and, and sometimes still today, I will take extra time to try to learn, figure out new things, you know, what are new methods? I can learn what what can I figure out? How what can I do to in, improve my edge? Um, but once you kind of reach the financial point that I've been lucky enough to hit, you know, work for me is what we talked about early in the interview. It's more for fun. It's more that I I love to be here. I love to do this. So it's not about the money anymore. It's about a love for the game. So when those setups are not there for me anymore, yeah, I'm totally getting out, doing something different, getting away. Um, so that when I come back to trade, I am, I'm happy about it. I'm excited about it. I'm ready to go. And I know in that state of mind, I have the best odds to best odds for success. Right then, you know, and I know you mentioned options change. So 
I wanted to yeah. talk a little bit about your foray into options because I think most sure. people might just know you as a, a trader of stocks. Sure. How, sure. how did the options um, trading come to happen and was it difficult for you to learn about options? Well, so yeah, I had tried to learn about options uh, really throughout my career. I had read books on options and I still couldn't figure it out. You know, I, 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 even to this day, you know, an option is like the right, but not the obligation to buy a stock at a certain price. I don't even know what that means. You know, I read these books. I have no idea what, what any of this stuff means. So I really, I had a mentor, um, a true expert in the industry, maybe five, six, seven years ago, come to me and say, hey, you know, if you kind of teach me to do a little bit of what you do, I will teach you options. And I thought, oh my God, that's great. So I had, you know, first of all, it helps when you have a background in stocks. You know, that that's the number one. When you have a background in stocks and you, I'm a technical analyst for a living. So I look at hundreds, if not thousands of charts every single day. So when you have that background of, you know, looking at charts, knowing how stocks trade, knowing how they should trade, um, and then you have a mentor kind of teach you options, those two, it, it came together for me really, really quick, much quicker than it did when I was learning stocks on my own back in college. Um, it was a pretty kind of a seamless integration into options. And what I love about options is, um, you know, there's no, there's no borrow fees, right? There's no locates, there's no overnights, there's no uh, having to get up at, you know, 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. fighting for shares and hitting that refresh button and locate monitor 100 times, 200 times. So um, I love trading options because, you know, just for those reasons, you know, the, the, you know, you're not paying for those shorts or those locates, but also because I can trade options a little more part time. You know, when you're, you know, like I said, I've tried, I want to get away from the computer a little bit more because I've kind of reached, you know, my goals. I've reached, you know, financially where I want to be, but I still want to trade the market, but I don't want to do it for seven, eight hours a day. So with options, you know, I can trade them an hour or two a day and I can take off and monitor them on my phone. You know, I don't have to be in front of my computer, you know, all day, every day, fighting these small caps, fighting these algorithms, fighting the manipulation that you see in the small caps. I mean, I still do that. I still trade those every day, but uh, I trade them just for maybe an hour or, or, or two, depending on what the setup is. So I have really loved options um, and it's a nice new, you know, exciting thing to, uh, you know, to try to figure out. Can you talk a little bit about what the process was like f of learning from somebody else? Because like you said, with stocks, you mm -hmm. did all of that work on your own. And so right. with options, you know, did you have to sort of come in with a, an extra open mind to, to think about, you know, to sort of let go and understand that this person was going to teach you the, yes. the proper way, the best possible way? And what was it like to, you know, have to sort of learn someone else's method rather than create it yourself? Sure. Yeah, well, luckily, I knew this person to be a, you know, kind of a, um, you know, an expert in the industry. So I knew right off the bat, okay, I'm learning from one of the best. But it was actually a little bit nice to kind of sit back and have him show, say, hey, this is kind of what I do. And for at least a month or two, it was kind of just copy and paste on my part, copy, paste, you know, I'm trading what you're trading. Now, again, with that being said, being that I had um, 10, 12, 13 years, whatever background experience in the market, the options came to me really quick. I mean, after a few weeks, it was like, wow, this makes sense. I mean, it didn't take long for it to really click with me and make sense. And then I still, you know, learned from the mentor. And then since then I've kind of expanded it, adapted, you know, I've given it my own personal touch without a doubt in the world. And, and I do a few different things, but um, yeah, I mean, without that mentor, the, the learning curve, I mean, he cut down, you know, the, the learning curve in time, I mean, huge. Um, but, you know, the nice thing about options as well is even to this day, it's still, you know, I've been trading them five or six years, but it's still something that every single day I can learn new option trading strategies out there. There's so many of them out there. I mean, there's so many ways to trade options um, and so many methods that I'm still doing it, you know, today, like, like as we speak, you know, tonight, after I read my kids a book uh, before they go to bed, I'm going to think, hmm, I, you know, what, what new way, technique or ticker could I try tomorrow? What will work? What doesn't work? So, 
um, that's something I just I just enjoy trying to kind of solve that problem and and enjoy trying to you know get to the next level you know with options or stocks or whatever that is. I wanted to ask a little bit about your investments and the ways that you think about uh, investments outside of trading. So sure. I know you've mentioned in the past about investing in U.S. farmland. And so right. can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? Were you already sort of well-versed and an expert in that field or how did that that happen? <laughs> no, no, I'm still not an expert in that field at all. But, um, you know, so when I started trading back when I was 18-ish, I loved real estate as well. I mean, I always had a knack for, you know, when I was trying to figure out a career in college, I loved the idea of doing something in real estate or doing something in the stock market because those two avenues, they let they give you the ability to work on your own, work for yourself, and they have unlimited earning potential. I think the stock market may be a little bit more than real estate, but it has unlimited earning potential. There is no cap. There is no max. You can't max out you know even a doctor one of the you know best doctor surgeons in the world they're still going to have kind of a cap as to uh you know what what they can earn so you know early on i owned you know rental properties um apartments and and condos and stuff like that really early in my trading career in my early 20s i started buying and i owned several and um and i liked it because i liked to the, the the feeling of the pride of owning, you know, real estate. I love that you can drive by it. You know, you're building equity. Your tenants are building equity for you. But I found out with, um, you know, rental property pretty quick that it's even if you have a property manager, which I did, it's still a. Uh, it's not a full time job, but it's not a part. I mean, I didn't want a part time job. You know, I don't want real estate to be a part time job. I want it to be. Um, just extremely passive, extremely passive income and growth. So I had the real estate. I loved it, but it was, be, it was taking away time and taking away thought process. It was taking away mental capital from the market, which I didn't want to do because the market is still where, you know, all my money and income is coming from pretty much, you know, the, the real estate is just kind of the long-term play here. So my wife actually grew up in a real small town in Illinois, uh, kind of a farming town, and, and her family had uh, a fair amount of farmland. So her dad is really the one that said, why don't you look into farmland as a different avenue? So I bought, uh, I, I really sold all of our rental properties several years ago, and I bought our, my, our first farm maybe uh, six years ago, six or seven years ago. And then since then, we've grown to a little over 4,000 acres here in Missouri. Um, and I absolutely love it because you know, it's safe, right? I mean, a million dollar farm or even a million dollar rental property today is a million dollar farm or rental property tomorrow. Whereas the stock market we've learned, you know, that's not the case. Even if you're a long-term investor, you know, we've seen some of these, you know, uh, uh, giant companies that should never lose market share, you know, Tesla and, and Facebook and Netflix, Google, Amazon, these stuff, stuff gets cut in half in months, you know, um, it's, it's dangerous. So what I love about farmland is I can't, I can't sell it. I can't click my mouse and say, you know what? I think farmland's going to, you know, I think it's hit a peak. I think it's going down over the next few months. Let me sell it and look to rebuy. You know, I'm actually a really bad long-term stock investor, like for my 401k, I've done a poor job at it because I think I can time the market accurately on a long-term basis. And I've been proven to be wrong. I can't. So luckily several years ago, I took my 401k and I just put all in index funds. I don't touch it. I don't manage it. It's just, it's there. And I think that's the better way for it. Nice thing with farmland, it's a, it's a long-term investment. I can't touch it. I collect my rent every single year. Um, it's extremely easy and, uh, it's an asset that really only two times in history back in the great depression. And then we had the interest rate crisis of the late eighties from has gone up virtually every single year outside of those two times, um, with COVID and then inflation, I've been lucky enough. It's seen a massive increase in value in the last couple of years, but, you know, whether it's farmland or whether it's apartments or whether it's. CDs or or ETFs or mutual funds or just a bank account. I, I, it's so so important for traders to have a backup plan, a retirement plan, uh, a savings plan. You know, for years when I when I started trading, really 
when I when I first had my senior year of college, when I turned that five thousand into a million, um, that summer I immediately lost a half a million dollars. So I went from five thousand to a million, and I went from a million back to five hundred. I immediately took out four hundred thousand, put it in the bank, and I started trading with a hundred thousand. And I said, you know what? Anything over a hundred at the end of the month, put in the bank account. And I did that like a year, two years, until I then said, okay, I need to increase my account balance a little bit. Let me take it up to 200,000. But in my entire career, I wire out minimum at the end of every single month. And I put those profits somewhere, whether they're into, you know, even years ago, money market accounts were making 0.5 or 0.3. I said, you know what? I, I can't, at least I can't lose it. It's safe. And I think it's so important for every trader to have a safety net and a uh, a plan for the future, whether that's, um, doesn't matter what it is. You know, I love farmland because it's easy and low key. I, I, you know, you can have apartments, mutual funds, stocks, bonds, you know, just cash, uh, something that you can put your profits in and know that even if you have a bad week or bad month or bad year, you have that stuff set aside. I've seen a lot of traders too that just they build their account and build it 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 and build it. Huge account balance. And guess what? They got stubborn on one trade or two trades and 80% of that's gone. You know, a year's work, five years of work, 10 years of work can be wiped out so fast. And, you know, you think, my God, why didn't you put any away? Why didn't you save anything? Why didn't you reinvest? And I think a lot of people don't do that. Some do, some don't, but it's so, so important to do that. So I'm a high, I, I, I firm believer that, you know, it, it, you know, part of having a long career in the market is having a backup plan as to where you put your profits, let them grow on the side, you know, outside of the market. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a very valuable point, especially because we think about trading and growing this balance and growing our accounts and there has to be a point for everybody, one would think, where they say, okay, this is sufficient. And they have to think about what, if anything, they're going to do with those profits. And I think it's important to hear from someone like yourself who's thinking about, you know, investing in, in other things and finding right. ways to make money other than just the market and thinking more long term than just right. growing an account balance. Without a doubt, you know, and, and again, when you're early in your career, you have no choice but to grow your account, right? I mean, you have no choice to say, okay, I've got 5K, I need to grow to 10, 10 needs to go to 20 or 30 or 50. But at some point, without a doubt, I mean, until you take, I always view it that until you pay yourself, until I take it out of my brokerage account, it's really not my money. I mean, I know it's my money in, in, in that account, but until it's in my bank, I don't feel that I've almost earned it, right? So. Um, oh, it's so, so important. Um, yeah, I mean, people, you, you, you just got to learn, you've got to get in the habit of, of paying yourself. And I've always been, I've always had the mindset of you save for a rainy day. I mean, I've always thought about the future. You know, when I was 20, I used to think about what do I want to do when I'm, you know, 30 or 40. You know, now that I'm, you know, 38, I think about what do I want to do when I'm 50 or 60. And I always think about the future and what it holds and the way the market, you know, maybe changes too. And <clears throat> Just because you've had a great year last year or the last three years or the last five years done it doesn't mean that you're going to have success next year or the next three years, or the next five years. You might have hardship. And if you don't have something put away, something saved, you know, you can be in real trouble. And, um, you know, we've seen it through, you know, Twitter, you know, some of these guys that are, you know, recently gotten busted by the SEC for stock manipulation. Everybody loves posting on Twitter their watches and their cars and their houses and, uh, you know, all that stuff, it's fun. And I have, I've been fortunate to have nice stuff too, but, you know, some of these traders that, you know, instantly maybe have success in the market and they have a hundred thousand dollars of profits, what do they do with it? Well, they go buy a hundred thousand dollar car. And it's like, was that really the best way you could spend that hundred thousand that you just earned? I mean, so I've always had the mentality that, uh, to you know, spend what you need and, and enjoy it, but you know, keep growing it as well because um, five years down the road, ten years down the road, you're gonna be really happy that you did versus buying that hundred thousand dollar car that today's worth you know ten grand. You know, <laughs> so absolutely, I, I think that's very mature and 
wise beyond one's years sort of thinking sure. because it it is really easy to just think about all the the wants that we might have in material possessions and otherwise but not necessarily distinguish those from what our needs are and maybe what right. we need at the moment is right. significantly different from what those wants are well and i think one thing that's helped me be successful is that you know you asked me earlier how, well how do you handle slow periods or i think your question was how do you how did you handle it when you started your career was, ah, how do i handle slow periods today i don't really care because so much of my profits are reinvested. You know, I could never trade another day and, and, our, and our farmland would support our more than our lifestyle for the rest of our lives. So when you, what helps me in slow times is knowing that I have saved and reinvested so much of my profits that I don't need that money to pay bills tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or the next several years where a lot of young traders, you know, not, not, I, I, I don't know if I should say a lot, but I've heard from several that you know, you, you work hard and you 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 make it and they just want to spend it. And I understand that part of it. But when you do that, you, you have no backup. So that means next week, you better keep making money because you have bills to pay, right? And, and um, you can get caught in that snowball effect of constantly making it, constantly spending it, but then being forced to then constantly make it again, right? Constantly make that money every week or every month, whatever it is. And I don't think that's a, a positive way to trade because you never want to feel forced. You never want to feel forced that, oh my God, I need to make this money or I've got to make that car payment or I've got to make that house payment or I've got to make this. You want to trade when your your mind is free and clear and you have no you know obligations whatsoever. So I have the comfort of hitting a uh, you know downturn in my trading, knowing that doesn't matter. It's more time off for me. More time off for me to go enjoy things that I love to do outside of trading, and and that's so uh, something I don't you know fear at all anymore. Excellent. Again, thank you so much. I think that's very mature advice sure. and and things for th people to think about. Sure. Another topic that I wanted to touch upon real quick, uh, Phil, was related to Traders for a Cause. You were the inaugural recipient of the Derek J. Leon Memorial Award. And first of all, congratulations on Thank that. Um, I, I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the impact that Derek had on you and what that relationship was like. What, would it was, what was it like to receive that award? And more broadly, you know, what impact can traders have on one another's lives? Sure. Yeah. No. Well, I was truly honored uh, and surprised to have won that award. Um, it was a travesty and a shock to everyone in the trading community when Derek passed away suddenly, um, you know, a couple of years ago. And I think it's great that Traders for Cause, uh, you know, Nate put that together for him in his honor and in his and in his memory. So I was truly honored to to win that award. Um, Derek was, you know, an amazing trader, an amazing person. I met him at Traders for a Cause first event ever. And I believe, I mean, I could be wrong. I've been to so many of them. I believe that was at Mandalay Bay. Um, and we instantly talked and instantly shared, you know, very similar style, very similar uh, approach. And we definitely, you know, had a great time sharing ideas, sharing strategies, sharing, you know, what kind of works for us. Um, and he would reach out to me, you know, you know, he was younger in his career. I think he, at that time, I, he was kind of just getting started, but he had, you know, he had found success. I mean, he was making, I know he had made over a million dollars at that time. Um, and we talked quite a bit about, you know, the only piece of advice, you know, he had a great personality in that he was not, you know, it's hard trading trade to get a personality in that you are not afraid to push the limits when the opportunity is there. You know, and when he saw opportunity, he pushed it. And that is a traders where you're going to make your big money, right? Day to day, you know, you're kind of swinging for singles, not trying to hit it. But, you know, as a trader, when you see that big opportunity, it takes a different set, you know, of trades to say, hey, I know I could lose more, but I'm going to bet more because the risk reward is on my side. And that's something Derek had fully. I mean, he, he had it. When he saw something, he pushed the limits. Now I told him, I said, Hey, 
Just be careful now because you can push your limits. Sometimes you can get in the habit of keep pushing those limits on not just an A setup, but you know, then a B setup or a C plus setup. So I love to share, you know, we, we used to have frequent text message conversations and calls to kind of just share um, those kind of those stories and situations um, that Derek, and that's something I definitely miss, you know, that now that he's gone. Yeah, absolutely. His passing was for a lot of us in the, the training world, a, a shock and s something that I'm, I'm sure like many, like myself, th think about him and didn't even know him, but his influence right. was so vast and, and so, so well known uh, within the trail oh, community. Without a doubt. Yeah. He gave several, uh, you know, speeches, interviews as well. And he became a, um, a big face in the trading community because he had success. I mean, you saw, he used to post, you know, at times, you know, his success on Twitter and people, so people knew, Hey, this guy knows what he's talking about. This guy is, is good at what he does. So he instantly, you know, found success, found that background. And yeah, without a doubt, when I heard of his passing, it was like, a, you, you were speechless. You didn't know what to say. It was like a punch in the gut. You know, it was like, wow, I can't believe that's possible. He's too young. I mean, you know, so, um, but as far as, you know, receiving his award, I have it um, on my little desk right behind me right there. It was a true honor to, to receive that. And I'm very grateful for it. What would you consider to be your greatest strength as a trader? A trader needs to have several strengths. I would say the first, the, the one is the one that kept me in the game when I was young and that's resilience. And I think that still is true today is that refusal to give up, um, refusal to take no for an answer, refusal to accept um, to be mediocre, right? I mean, I kind of am driven to succeed no matter what it takes. And it takes, you know, anything, I think anybody that wants to be a real successful trader for the long haul needs to understand that failure is part of the game. Without a doubt, you got, you're going to fail. And it's, you know, how do you come back from those failures? You know, what do you, what do you do? How do you react? You know, what do you learn? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of traits that I think it takes to be a successful trader. We talked about discipline earlier. We just talked about, you know, Derek Leon, his ability to push the limit when you see a good setup. And, you know, if you want to, if you want to make big money, you got to be willing to push the envelope when that one trade or two trades or three trades a year are there. That's another one. Discipline is one. Resilience is one. Um, but I would say if I had to pick one, yeah, it'd be resilience. Just the, the, the unwillingness to, to accept failure um, and, and just the drive to keep going, to keep learning, to keep adapting and keep changing with the market. As the market changes, you need to change. So I, so I would say that's probably number one. And are there any areas of your trading that you would like to improve on? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I would love to you know, again, as I get older in my career and I, and I figure, hey, okay, how do I want to, what do I want to do? You know, I'll be 39 in a month, but how do I want to trade in my 40s or, you know, my gosh, even 50s? It's scary to think about that. You know, I want to, I'll always be involved in the market, right? I love the markets. I'll always be involved, but how do I have less screen time? How do I still, how do I still get my fill, get my fix, still make money? Because that's what I, you know, it's, I just like to do it, but how do I work less? So I would love to um, be able to, buy more stocks and hold them, you know? I mean, and I don't mean in my retirement account index fund and stuff like that. I mean, you know, how do I find a stock like Meta that recently, a few months ago, got crushed down sub 100, and now it's trading up to, you know, 180. You know, you can make 80% or 90% right away. Tesla, as we speak, uh, recently, I think hit lows in December. Now it's, you know, 100 bucks. Now it's up to 200, you know, that was an easy, quick, 100% gain. You know, no matter what it is, those styles are different styles, but being able to just buy stocks and hold them all over the long term basis. When I say long term, even a month, month, three months, six months, a year, whatever that is, um, because obviously I think the biggest ways to make the most money in the market are to buy stocks. Right. I mean, that's I mean, there's more wealth made uh, in the history of the market by buying companies, buying stocks. I mean, Warren Buffett. Right? I mean, I. I I highly doubt he's ever shorted a stock in his life. I don't. I know he doesn't trade small caps and that kind of thing. So, 
you know, there's a huge avenue there, but I, I, I can't lie. I've never, I, I, I have not had the discipline and, and a lot of the traits that it takes to become successful as a long biased trader. And, you know, and I've always wanted to learn it. Um, but again, at times, there's one thing to learn it, one thing to study it. There's also another avenue of saying you can only do so many things at so, so many times. So if you're trading options full time and you're still trading small caps full time and you're you know, involved with farmland and a few other things, um, I, I just haven't put forth the complete effort yet to indulge into you know, that longer term investing. But I would love to do that someday. And I think I will. How much success I have, I have no idea. But as I want to get away from the monitors more, I think that's the avenue to do it is to, you know, have more trades that are long term basis on the long side. We can kind of buy it. You don't have to micromanage it. You don't have to stare at it every day. You can look at it from your phone and just hopefully gradually see it increase in value. So that that's kind of the one thing that I would love to figure out. And it's kind of sad because that's the one thing that I think any normal long term investor has. I mean, if you if you go down the street and somebody says, well, what do you do for the living? And I say, well, I'm in the stock market. Well, their, their mind immediately goes to, well, you buy stocks and you hold them, but that's not me. I can't do it. <laughs> you know, I'm terrible at it. Uh, so if I could learn it someday, I, I'd love it. And are there any myths that you think exist out there in the world of trading? Any myths? Uh, yeah, the trading's easy, that, that, that you can do it part-time, that it maybe doesn't take a lot of work. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've heard, being that I've been involved with the market 18 or so years, and I've, I've done a lot, you know, some, a few interviews, and I've talked to people through chat rooms or Twitter or a person in Vegas or on the phone. I've heard so many different things that I think are wrong, that I think are myths. but. The biggest myth, I think, are the fact that people that have full-time jobs that think they can come in and trade and have success. And I, I just, I, I don't see it happening. You know, again, you can be a long-term investor. I think that's fine. You know, you can buy today, First Solar is gapping up huge on earnings. You know, you can buy those companies and hold them a few months and I think and have some success. Um, but Overall day trading, you know, it's a full-time job. And I think if you want to achieve success, I think you have to understand that. So there's definitely the myth that anybody can open up an account and be successful because that's just, that's not true. You might have success for a few months, maybe a year or two, but if you don't, I think give it a substantial amount of effort that it requires and takes, I don't think long-term you're gonna have success as a trader. Is there one piece of advice that you've been given by another trader that you think is exceptionally helpful? You know, not, I don't know that there is. I, I think, again, it, it goes back to what I spoke about a few minutes ago, just being resilient, realizing that I think there are so many younger traders out there that put in you know, six months of time or nine months of time, and they're upset because they had the same results I had back in college or, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And, and I think they want to quit. Um, they want to give up. And, you know, you have to be resilient. You have to, you know, if I think back to those days, if I would have quit after two years of trading and said, you know, at my senior college, I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to party or, or, or do whatever else you can do. I would have never turned five grand into a million and thought, oh my God, this is my career. This is my life. This is how it works. So you never know when that one trade, that one event, that one time period you could enter uh, is going to occur. You know, even thinking back to, you know, 2020, um, you know, that time period that we entered those last you know, well, nine months a year, the market was so on fire. You never know when you're going to enter a period of the market where it finally gets easy. I mean, you 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 will have times in the market where things get easy, right? Um, there's other times in the market where things are tough. And a lot of times I would say things are tough. But, you know, you got to realize that the market moves in cycles and you never know when you're going to see that one stock that could open up your eyes. You know, I had that one stock back in college 
Um, the symbol was CAFE, C-A-F-E, is my first ever short. And I made a tremendous amount of money on that short. And instantly, I mean, my love for the markets went from 100 to 1,000 overnight. You know, that one single trade opened my eyes. So, <clears throat> you know, to anybody else learning or struggling or trying to figure it out, you know, you never know when that one trade or opportunity or event is going to occur for you. And if you give up too early, then, you know, you, you won't be there for the success that you're, I think, you know, destined or determined to have. If you could go back to your college days and give yourself during that time one piece of advice, what do you think it would be? And how do you think your college self would receive that advice? Yeah, it's hard because again, one piece of advice, there's so many things to to remember and to think about. Um, I, you know, I'd have to say again, it was, you know, resilience back then. I, I had to have way more resilience back then than I do today because at that time I had no success. I mean, it was pretty much just failure, 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 failure. I may make a little bit of money, but then failure, 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 failure. And, you know, now if I need resilience, it's, you know, just because you hit a rough streak a few weeks trading or a month or two is tough or something like that. Um, but, you know, resilience is number one. But again, thinking back to when I first started trading, it's a, you know, I think I was really fortunate that I had no outside world or trading help to get me there because I had to either, you know, achieve success or fail on my own. You know, that was it. And um, through that resilience and through that, you know, willingness to, you know, not fail, it helped me achieve success because it took, you know, I was forced to study thousands and thousands and thousands of hours on my own. Um, and then, and, and then once you do that, once you put in that much time, of course, you're going to finally figure it out. You know? um, but, you know, I think a lot of traders today, you know, they want, and, and it's not just traders, it's Americans. I mean, why is the lottery up to $2 billion? Because so many people are buying tickets. So many people want that free ride, that easy way out. Um, they want that, you know, they, they want that lottery ticket win. And, you know, I've never bought a lottery ticket in my life. I would rather say, you know what? No, let me sit down and try to figure out how to buy stocks long-term that I suck at. I would rather put my effort and energy and my time into that than trying to buy a lottery ticket. But I think the mentality is, you know, um, screwed up amongst some that, you know, Americans in general, where they want that easy way out. Um, they don't want to put in the hard work that it takes, whether it's the stock market or whether it's real estate or whether it's whatever career you're in. If you want to achieve success, you know, how else are you going to do it without hard work? That's what it takes, you know. I guess last question is for those listening who want to learn more about you or uh, want to contact you, how can they do so? Uh, well, my Twitter, you know, is trade STL. Um, I'm on Twitter. You can message me. I'm in investors underground chat room. Um, and, um, you know, the a lot of times the best way too is in person in Vegas in October. I love, I love chatting with traders. I mean, that's, that's one of the best is meeting people face to face and chatting, but uh, any, any of those three ways that will, will work for sure. Well, thank you so much, Phil, for taking the time to speak with me today. It's been an absolute honor to get to, to talk to you like this. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing you in Vegas. I've enjoyed it. I appreciate the interview. There, it, was a, it was a great time, Anthony. Anytime. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. Thanks for watching.